Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. And today, we're going to talk about Norse wolves. So not only are there so many amazing wolf monsters, wolves, werewolves in Norse myth to merit their own episode, but I can also answer two questions I've gotten uh, with one monster. One is, what's your favorite monster? And another question is, what's that album cover you have for this podcast? Uh, the Monster Professor, and there's this like album cover that shows up um, on iTunes or on YouTube. Uh, that I use that for the video. Um, the, uh, the, uh, on my website, joshwoodsauthor.com. The answer to both questions is Fenrir. I'm excited that it's finally time to talk about Fenrir, not only the king of wolves in Norse myth, but the king of all wolves who have ever existed in real life or in the imagination. So here's Fenrir's story. Fenrir is one of the three famous children of the Norse god Loki. Loki is the troublemaker, uh, He sneaks off uh, to do a lot of bad things all the time. Uh, One of those things is he sneaks off and has affairs with giantesses. They're on the enemy side, right? You have the Asgardians, the Norse gods on one side, and they're always gearing up for this eventual battle against the giants and the trolls. Um, There's not supposed to be much... uh, interaction between the two other than battle but loki sneaks off away from his wife and has an affair with a giantess named anger boda he has three children by her or she has three children by him and one of those is the midgard serpent jormungandr which we've talked about on the snakes or the serpents and dragons episode another one is hell and we'll probably get to her on an episode when we talk about hell. Um, and the third and my favorite favorite is Fenrir. So there's this little wolf pup that's born. And when he's born, uh, essentially the Norse gods have to deal with him. And they, where Odin takes uh, charge and he decides he's got to do something with Loki's three problematic kids. And so he tosses Jormungandr out into the sea where he grows so big he encircles the earth. He uh, assigns Hel a place in the underworld and he puts her in charge of it. And with Fenrir, they're kind of like maybe thinking they can raise it and keep this one under control among themselves. And the problem is he keeps growing faster and faster and eating more and more at an alarming rate. Only one of the gods is willing to really take care of him. His name is Tyr. T-Y-R. Tyr is a fascinating god. You don't hear much about him if you're just kind of looking over secondary materials about Norse mythology. It might say something like he's a, a, a god of battle or something like that. And that's true enough. But there is a lot of indication that he was king of the gods before Odin took over. And I mean that in like a deep way, like not just in the mythological stories themselves, like in the storyline that Tyr was God and then Odin came and took the throne, but also culturally that the Scandinavians worshipped or acknowledged a god named Tyr, and he had certain qualities. 
And then a different kind of god, Odin, grew and grew in popularity, especially as the Viking era came along when uh, like conquest and trickery uh, came to be much more important than old school, kind of just straightforward battle. And so Odin replaced Tyr as lord and king of the gods. And so you have this sense, uh, even in the stories that hang around, that Tyr is kind of this older, battled veteran guy who's kind of tougher and grittier. Uh, Not kind of just strong, but knuckleheaded and kind of dumb, but good-hearted like Thor. And not necessarily uh, an opportunistic, uh, scheming, uh, vicious battle god like Odin. But something else, uh, an old gritty kind of uh, old gritty kind of war vet. He's really cool. He's the one who decides. Oh, he'll take care of Fenrir, uh, in, in that he's the only one brave enough to feed this thing, who's growing and chomping up food at an alarming rate. And then they decide. The gods decide. Man, we got to do something about this wolf. We have to bind him up and throw him away somewhere. Now the question comes in, uh, why don't you just kill him off if you know he's going to be big trouble for you down the line? And he is big trouble down the line. Um, Well, the the great Icelandic poet Snorri Sturluson, who took a lot of the Elder Edda, the Poetic Edda uh, materials and reinterpreted them in a handbook of his called the Prose Edda, he asks and addresses that very question. He's like, no, there's no way the gods could risk uh, slaying Fenrir and spilling his evil wolf's blood all over Asgard that would curse the land. They have to just like tie him up and get rid of him. In other words, uh, Loki fathered this thing and now we have to just deal with the fact that it's going to keep existing until the end of the world. So what do we do with it? Let's chain it up. And so and so they uh, they all go in on this plan, and they end up uh, commissioning this fetter, this kind of chain uh, series of leashes, and it's really strong. It even has a name, like a lot of great things in Norse myth. It's called loathing. I don't think, however, that it's necessarily connected to our word loathing. Um, and so they take it to Fenrir, and they're like, look. Uh, we think you're strong enough to break this, but why don't you just test out your strength? Let us put this on you and, uh, and then we'll stand back and we'll see if you can break through it. And so Fenrir thinks, okay, well, I might actually be able to break this. I'm kind of growing. I don't quite know my own strength. Plus, Fenrir the wolf is thinking like a lot of Norse heroes, which is, I need to gain some renown. I need to get a reputation as a badass, and I need to gain some honor in one way or another. And you can only do that by accomplishing great feats. So go ahead, put put this thing on me. And so they do, and he strains against it, and boom, it snaps and flies everywhere. And that, a lot faster than the Norse gods were planning on that. They thought maybe he had a chance, but they wanted to test it, and boom, right away, they lost it. And, and he... Fenrir rightfully gains the fear and respect that he deserves at that point. And so the gods are like, oh man, what are we going to do? They have to figure out a way to get a tougher one. So they end up making another fetter uh, twice as strong. And this one's called a Dromi. And they do the same thing to Fenrir. They walk up to him. They're like, look, why don't you try this one out? And he's like, no, 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 no. That one's a lot tougher. Obviously, that's thicker and stronger. But he goes, you know what? How can I gain renown if I don't make myself vulnerable, put myself in places of danger, and then try out my strength. So go ahead and put it on me. And so they do. And then as soon as they do, he shakes himself. He knocks the fetter against the ground. He struggles. He digs in his feet so hard that the fetter breaks into pieces and flies everywhere. And 
Then the gods are like, Mike, I don't know what we're going to do now. We've got to do something that's more than just make strong chains. And so they end up uh, going down to the world of dark elves to talk to dwarves. And in, in, the, in the old Norse stuff, there's not a clear distinction between elves and dwarves. In fact, it seems to be that dwarves are a certain type of dark elf, but they're really good at engineering things. They made Mjolnir, uh, Thor's hammer, by the way. They made Gungnir, Odin's spear. So they go to the, the, the dwarves and they're like, you've got to make something that nothing in the world can break out of. And so the dwarves make a ribbon. It's just a ribbon of silk, but it is made in, it is made from impossible ingredients. So here's the list of ingredients that this ribbon of silk is made out of. It's made from six things. The noise a cat makes when it moves, the beard of a woman, the roots of a mountain, the sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish and the spittle of a bird. Isn't that cool? And then Snorri Sturluson in the narration, or he has one of his characters say, and and you know what I'm telling you is true because now uh, women have no beards and fish have no breath and, and cats make no noise when they walk and because those things were used up in the making of this silk ribbon. And so the gods take this up to Fenrir and they're like, look, uh, you're so strong and you could break all those other big, strong, amazing fetters. So why don't you just do one more uh, and you'll have no problem with this. It's just a ribbon. And Fenrir is like, oh, no, 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 no. This is trickery. I can tell right away because you wouldn't you wouldn't test out just a ribbon after all those chains. I'm smarter than that, guys. And he said, you know, not only that, but whatever trickery you have on it, if I try it out and I can't break it in this test of strength, um, then you guys are going to like lock me up or do something with me. They're like, no, 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 no. We promise if you can't break out of it, then we'll let you out. And he goes, well, yeah, it'll probably be a long time though. <laughs> like you'll tie this on me and I can't get out and everyone will just leave. Y'all just leave me out here. And so it'll probably be centuries before you come back for me. I'm not playing this trick. And they're at a standoff, right? And stand still in this problem in that Fenrir doesn't want to just say flat no, because as he says, I can't be a coward. I can't say a flat no, but I'm not letting myself get tricked. And so Fenrir goes, all right, how about this? One of you place his hand in my mouth, in my jaws. And if I can't get free of this fetter, then you let me out of this fetter like you're promising. And if you pull anything, then somebody's going to lose a hand. I will chomp down and God or not, you are not getting this hand back if Fenrir himself bites it off. And then the gods are looking at each other going, uh oh, because our actual plan is to screw him over if he can't get out of it, uh, to leave him chained up for, or fettered for all time. And so essentially somebody's going to have to lose a hand in order for, uh, for us to, to keep, uh, in order for us to keep Fenrir fettered up. So which God do you think goes, I'll do it. That's right. It's tear. He goes, I'll do it. He knows he's about to go forth and just lose a hand for all time. And so, uh, he places his hand in Fenrir's mouth, in his jaws, and then the gods put the fetters on him, this silk ribbon, and there they stand while Fenrir struggles. That's the moment, that's the image on the album uh, cover that I choose for this podcast. So many amazing elements in there. Um, and of course, what happens... Fenrir struggles, can't get out. And he's like, all right, guys, let me out. And they're going, nope, we got you now. And so he snaps down, bites off Tyr's hand. He loses his hand. He's the one-handed god, Einander Tyr, uh, from that point forward. So they end up 
taking Fenrir, dragging him. They put a huge chain on around the ribbon, by the way, so they don't have to get too close to him. And they drag him down to this uh, great pit and they throw him all the way down on this down in this pit. And then to make sure he doesn't like to chew his way up and out, they take this big sword and they put the handle of it down in the bottom of his mouth and the tip of it at the roof of his mouth. So he can't bite down without shoving the sword through his own brain. And then they put another big boulder on top of that. And his saliva continues to drip as he struggles and moans and screams down there. And his saliva ends up making a river of the underworld and there Fenrir is kept until the end of time but here's the amazing thing about Norse myth is not it's not one of these everlasting kind of myths that never that doesn't seem to have uh, an end to the beginning not like say Greek mythology or any of these things it, instead it does have an end uh, there's there was kind of this rebirth Christian ending added onto it much later especially in Snorri Sturluson's time but the original is the final battle at the end of the world, Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods is coming. And that's just that. And all the gods are going to die and all the monsters are going to die in this great big battle. Well, eventually Ragnarok comes just as the gods predicted and the stars are falling from the heavens and the mountains tremble and the trees are uprooted and all fetters and bonds will be snapped. And that means you know who is getting out. Fenrir gets loose. And so when Fenrir gets loose, um, uh, Snorri Sturluson's version of it says, The wolf Fenrir will advance with wide open mouth, his upper jaw against the sky, his lower on the earth. He would gape even more widely still if there were room and his eyes and nostril will blaze with fire and he runs for, and this is the, I'm moving on from this, uh, from the excerpt. And so he runs forth and just eats and eats and eats the whole world. And finally he catches up with Odin, the king of the gods, these guys who tied him up and essentially buried him alive for who knows how long before Ragnarok comes. And he swallows Odin, king of the gods. That is the end of Odin. That's it. I mean, Odin's an amazing, an amazing figure in mythology. And there's a lot to talk about. But how does he end? Well, he gets swallowed up by Fenrir. But his son, in the midst of this battle, sees this and gets revenge. And so his son has been piecing together this magic boot. And this, and this magic boot is made out of all the little scraps of leather that Scandinavians have uh, trimmed off of their own boots and shoes. And so if you want to help out this uh, magic boot in the end of the world in Ragnarok, make sure to throw those away if you trim off any little extra leather on your boots. You're going to help out the construction of this magic boot so there's no chewing through it. And so uh, Odin's son, Vidar, one of his many sons, uh, walks up to Fenrir, Fenrir opens his mouth wide to swallow him up and he steps this magic boot on the lower jaw of Fenrir and presses on the upper jaw of Fenrir and then rips his throat asunder. And that's the end of Fenrir. So what's at the heart of the Fenrir story? Or maybe another way of asking it, what is it about that singular image of Tyr having his hand in the mouth of Fenrir while Fenrir is fettered is compelling enough that I want that to be the image of the monster professor? Well, I think there's so many fascinating aspects or so many fascinating concepts going on all at once in that singular frozen moment of that image. You have this monster that Tyr and the other gods know is one day going to be their very doom. And Tyr has been feeding this thing and taking care of it. And now he's having to feed it his own hand in order to betray the thing 
so that he can put it away so it won't cause any more problems for now. And so he's sacrificing it. So he's bravely putting his own hand as sacrifice in the mouth of the monster that he helped raise. But even though they're successful in uh, binding and 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 essentially uh, imprisoning uh, Fenrir until the end of the world, the thing, the horror that they've been feeding, uh, that they've tried to put away and imprison, will eventually come back for them. And so there's this wonderful image, essentially, of somebody like risking and sacrificing himself uh, for the thing that he created just to put that thing away. And, but one day it will come back to get him. I don't know what about myself or the Monster Professor podcast exactly maps onto that, but I feel like there's something there. And I think that's, uh, that's a, that's a, such a such an applicable kind of concept all in one story and one image that I think there's something perhaps archetypical or universal about it I can't exactly figure out what except to speak in those abstractions as I just did but it's more than just that that Fenrir is my favorite monster because he is a monster who has not only his own storyline and his his own motivations, he wants glory, he wants honor, he wants to be considered brave and strong, not cowardly like any regular kind of person, but he is betrayed, but not out of his stupidity, like he even sees it coming and allows himself uh, to be put in this test, but even tries to come up with a way to like uh, have insurance for it, as in he wants the hand of the mouth that fed him, uh, or that the hand that fed him in his mouth, and as insurance, thinking surely they won't go this far to sacrifice themselves to betray me, yet they do, and so he is utterly betrayed and tortured for a really long time, and his. The, not, the two things that bind him are the silken ribbon made out of impossible things, right? So beware of letting yourself get tied down to something that seems innocuous, but you have a feeling that there's trickery behind it. That's what the Fenrir story tells us. But on top of that, when they, when they imprison him under the earth, that sword in his mouth uh, keeps him from biting down in that... Uh, giving in to his urge to bite will actually kill himself. So he's in danger of biting himself until the end of days when he finally gets to come back and the monster gets revenge. He get a world destroying monster, but he was in the right. They did him wrong. He never did anything wrong to them. Not until he finally gets out and gets his revenge, at which point it's all justified. And when some, I, not only do I love good revenge stories, but if your justified revenge is essentially eating the world and the god of gods. Uh, that's a badass monster and absolutely my favorite of them. A lot of really cool elements going on in that, but there's another aspect to it, which is a lot of the wolves of Norse myth end up having a twin counterpart. And for Fenrir, as interesting and unique as his story is, there's another uh, wolf or hound named Garm. And he ends up being this, this monstrous wolf. In fact, um, in the Elder Edda, it says he is the greatest of all hounds or all wolves, even though elsewhere it says that Fenrir is. There seems to be some crossover between the two. So his story, not as detailed, but he's chained up at the mouth of the cave to the underworld where the dead must go uh, to get to hell. By the way, um, you go to hell if you uh, die of sickness or old age, right? If you die in battle, then you get a chance to go to Valhalla. Uh, that's uh, that's Odin's Hall in Asgard. Um, so he's this wolf guardian, hound guardian of the underworld, and Garm is... Um, 
And that's, you can see a clear connection between that and Kerberos or Cerberus too. Uh, but he's fettered there. And when all fetters break and Ragnarok, he gets out, he comes to this battle and he squares off against Tyr. And Snorri Sturluson, and I think in the Elder Edda too, it says, you know, Garm is the worst sort of monster. He battles with the old veteran battle god Tyr, and he ends up slaying Tyr. And that's the end of Tyr. Well, wouldn't it, wouldn't it have like been more uh, poetically mirrored and like arranged correctly if when Fenrir got out, he went after Tyr, like the, the guy who fed him, uh, not only fed him as a pup, but fed him his own hand. Wouldn't Tyr want to battle with that one? Instead, Tyr gets matched up with Garm. That's kind of confusing, but there's plenty of reason to believe the farther back you go, that Garm and Fenrir were the same the same character, the same story element. But the, as the tales went on, uh, there was there was plenty of contradiction. And how can how can Fenrir both be tied up and held, you know, with a sword in his mouth under a boulder under the earth until Ragnarok? But at the same time, you've got Garm, who's the active guardian at the mouth of the cave to the underworld. Uh, well, how can if Fenrir was in both, or they were both named Garm, or whatever it was, and so the story ends up splitting off. There is still plenty of contradiction in Norse myth. Uh, one of the delightful things about it is there's no way it can all the the family um, family trees match up or the plot matches up. There's just no way. There's too many crazy things going on. But at least least in that one, you have a, a singular wolf split off into two directions. Um, and so another another wolf pair, uh, twin wolves, are the wolves who and Ragnarok get loose, and we don't really know where they came from originally, but one of them is named Skull, and one of them is named Hati. And that essentially means uh, the first one kind of like scorn and the other is hatred and they get loose. And so in Ragnarok, the very first thing they do is one of them, Skull, chases after the sun as it goes across the sky. And the other one, Hati, chases the moon as it rolls across the sky. And they're trying to eat the sun and the moon, respectively. In Norse myth, uh, uh, the sun is feminine and the moon is masculine. So it's like a brother and sister pair running away from these two evil wolves, scorn and hatred. And eventually, Skull swallows up the sun and Hadi swallows up the moon. And then that is the end of the sky and the heavens as we know it. There's some indication elsewhere that Fenrir is the thing swallowing the sun and the moon, right? I mean, he opens his mouth so wide that his nose presses against the ceiling of the sky, his jaw against the earth, and he's just running along, just swallowing up everything. Um, and so that could be, in fact, that th there was an old version in which Fenrir swallows both, or then Fenrir and Garm swallow both, and then Fenrir and Gar, instead of swallowing the sun and moon, swallow Odin and Tyr, and then two other wolves are assigned to the sun and moon, or maybe not. Maybe there's just, uh, maybe there are just that many amazing wolves in Norse mythology. So another pair of wolves that we get with the Norse are Odin's two wolves. Odin has a lot of cool possessions, and uh, I think a lot of people have the image of the one-eyed Odin on his throne with his spear, and he has his two crows, Hunan and Munin, on his shoulders. And those crows are cool, and we need to talk about them at some point. But he also has two wolves at his feet, and they are Gary and Freki. I like to call him Jerry and Freaky, by the way, uh, just to entertain myself as a terrible pronunciation that sounds funnier in the modern era, Jerry and Freaky, uh, but I think it's more correctly pronounced Gary and Freaky. Those are both versions of what would translate to be hunger or ravenous, gluttonous um, appetite. And so these are Odin's two wolves. And it says of him in the Eddas of Odin that he feeds his wolves from his own plate. 
In fact, uh, Snorri Sturluson goes so far. No, I think it's in the Elder Edda too. So I don't think it's just Snor- uh, Snorri adding to this. Um, that he feeds them all his own food. And so Odin never eats. He only drinks wine. It also says, uh, definitely in the, in, the, in the Poetic Edda, the old one, um, that that Odin feeds uh, these wolves the flesh of the fallen. And so he sends them out into the battlefield and they eat dead humans. There's some crossover there suggesting that Odin's true meal is the flesh of of fallen soldiers or those who die in battle, but he no longer eats that. He outsources that to his two wolves and instead he only drinks wine. And what's up with Odin not eating, but instead his two wolves do? I don't know. I think he's, he has, so Odin's this weird contradiction of both like old, like omnipotence, but impotence at the same time of Odin's, uh, many, many names, uh, dozens of names. And he has like a top 12 names. A lot of them are this like hyper potent, like Odin, you know, world slayer kind of names. But one of them is gelding as in he's like castrated as well. I think there's something, uh, to that. That's not so much impotent as in, uh, transcendent or superior to mere earthly, uh, needs and desires. Uh, and so I think maybe that's a little bit what's coming in with the wolves that he's both simultaneously. He, Odin himself is so ravenous and has such a great appetite that he needs, that he has two stomachs to fill at any given time. So much so that he can't handle just the meat put on his plate. He eats the dead themselves who die in battle but he's kind of superior to needing to eat a bunch of stuff like, like Loki does. Loki's not superior to that. He will, Loki smashes his face down into troughs of food and runs along and tries to win eating contests. Loki's hilarious. Um, but, uh, but Odin is not only has the superior appetite, uh, but is superior to an appetite. And so others eat for him. He only drinks wine. So if you put together a lot of what we just talked about here, you're starting to see a deep uh, and powerful irony that surrounds Odin and that he has his two wolves that he feeds humans to, right? And he feeds others to wolves. Uh, yet in the, at the, at Ragnarok, at the end of his days, he himself becomes wolf food, the very thing that he was feeding his wolves on, uh, fallen warriors in battle. He himself becomes a fallen warrior in battle and becomes wolf food. And Tyr, the other battle god who fed Fenrir and then fed Fenrir his hand in order to put him away, is devoured by Garm. And so you have another fallen warrior god uh, eaten by the very wolves uh, that so far they've been feeding. And so that concept uh, pretty much is a a deep well you can keep swimming down as far as what it means, uh, what it means to feed this kind of monster and and seem to benefit from it or sacrifice uh, to a monster and eventually be consumed by that same, by that same pattern. That's, that's at least a little bit of, of where I'm going with a possible interpretation. I'm not quite sure. Um, so more Norse wolves in the Volsung saga, it's this, it's a uh, series of tales following, uh, one family line, the line that ends up being called Volsung named after one of the famous, uh, members of this line. Um, in some ways it's a little bit like the old Testament stories, uh, starting with Abraham and going through the different line and you follow, uh, the different, the different strange stories of each generation. And each one of them has a, like a celebrity of, of that, of that era. Um, that's kind of how Volsungs works too. One of the Volsungs, by the way, is Sigurd who slays Fafnir the dragon. 
But earlier than that, we get a tale in which in which uh, Volsung himself is uh, preparing to battle this enemy king uh, who married Volsung's daughter, Signy. And it's a really cool story, but I'll just skip over a lot of that to get to the wolf. And so long story short, king comes in, he wins, slays Volsung, takes Signy back as his wife, who tried to get away from him. She hates him, he's an evil dude. Uh, and she, And then he also captures... Uh, the ten sons of Volsung, and so uh, Signy's ten brothers, and she's trying to come up with some way to buy him time, rather than just have them all slaughtered right there, and that's it. And so she begs them to to torture her ten brothers for as long as possible by putting them in the stocks and leaving them out in the woods. And the king's like, "That's an odd thing to ask for your own brothers. That's a much worse fate than I was gonna do. I was just gonna slaughter them quickly and be done with it. But that sounds great to me because they'll suffer. Let's do it." He puts them in stocks, puts them out in the woods, and then every night, one night after another, here creeps in this giant, terrifying she-wolf. And uh, this she-wolf, it's in the story, it says perhaps she was actually a witch who is the mother of this king who put these ten sons in the stocks in the first place and killed Volsung in the first place. And so it's this wolf who is a, a witch werewolf who sneaks up to these 10 men locked hand and foot into these stocks. And she sneaks up to one, sniffs him, licks him. And then the Volsung saga said she bit him to death and swallowed him all up. <laughs> and, so, and so she just totally ate up one of them out of the stocks. Night two, she goes up to another one, sniffs him, sniffs him, licks him, and then rips him to shreds and eats them all up. Night three, night four, night five, it keeps going. Signy finds out about this and like, oh, this is this is really bad. And so, so she comes up with a plan though. A bunch of honey. She sends a messenger out to the last, uh, the last of her brothers, and with all this honey and. He smears it all over the brother and puts a bunch of it in the brother's mouth. And he's like, you'll figure out what to do with this. And the brother's like, okay, okay, I guess. And so here comes the she-wolf at night to finish off the last of them. She walks up to him. She sniffs him and she catches the scent of honey. She licks him and it's honey and she really likes it. And so she starts licking all the honey off of him in kind of this bear kind of way. By the way, the Scandinavians uh, uh, very often intertwined bear and wolf. In fact, uh, their their word for bear was bee wolf, as in the wolf that likes to go around and, and chase bees for honey. And that's where we get the name Beowulf. He essentially was, and that means bear. That was his name. Um, so this wolf licks off all the honey and she can smell that there's still a bunch of honey in this guy's mouth. And so uh, she she sniffs at it and tries to lick inside his mouth. So she puts her tongue in his mouth. And that's when the son, his name, his name, by the way, is Sigmund. Uh, she puts her tongue in his mouth and he bites down and he won't let go. And so she struggles and kicks away and she ends up kicking the stalks all to splinters and he is free, but he still won't let go. And so she pulls and pulls and he pulls too until he tears her tongue out by its roots and she dies. And then he runs off into the woods and builds this underground dwelling and keeps communicating through messengers and secrecy back and forth with his sister. And so Sigmund is able to keep the line going. Um, so his sister uh, ends up having children with this evil king and she's hoping that her children will help avenge her true family that she is really loyal to and so every time she has a son she sends him out to Sigmund uh to to for Sigmund to test his strength and raise him and make him a tough Volsung but every time they fail the test until the test, by the way, is Sigmund says, I'm going to go f gather firewood. You need to just uh, take this sack of flour and make some bread for when I get back. And so he gets back and the 10-year-old and the boy is like, uh, I didn't make the flour. 
Sigmund's like, why not? He goes, or I didn't make the bread. And Sigmund's like, why not? He's like, because there's something alive in the bag of flour. And so <laughs> Sigmund's like, yeah, you're weak. And he kills him out in the woods. And so this keeps happening. And so uh, Signe's like, I've, I've got to have someone who's pure Volsung blood. So she meets up with a sorceress and they change shapes. And in the shape of the sorceress, she goes out to her brother. They have sex. She gets pregnant. She gives birth to a son and then sends that son out. And then this Sigmund puts the same test to him. And then he gets back and the, and the bread is done and baked. He goes, um, did you have any reservations while you were break, baking this bread? And the boy was like, yeah, I, um, I had my doubts uh, about it because I'm pretty sure something was alive in there, but I just kneaded it, smashed it apart and kneaded it into the dough and baked it anyway. And Sigmund's like, okay, very good, but don't eat it because that was the most venomous snake in the world <laughs> that I had in the sack of flour. So let's go and kill it. So he wants to, it's, it says in the Volsung Saga, he wants to... Uh, um, uh, accustom this boy to hardships and so they go out in the woods uh, killing people and stealing their stuff and they eventually come to this house in which these two guys these two princes are asleep and they're asleep under these wolf skins and so Sigmund and the boy take the wolf skins and put them on and they can't get them off and the narration tells us that you can only get them off once every 10 days. And so they run around through the woods. It doesn't clarify that they're now werewolves or they're wolves, but I mean, but it just kind of assumes that they are. Uh, it says, here's how it words it. It says uh, that Sigmund and his, and his son, they put on the skins and could not get them off. And quote, the weird power was there as before. They howled like wolves, both understanding the sounds. Now they set out into the forest, each going his own way. And so at that point, they they agree to go just run through the wood, woods and eat and slaughter as many as seven men on their own. If they came across more than seven, they would howl for the other. And so there's a storyline of the, the son, uh, the younger one, being a little bit too overconfident, picks a fight too big for himself, gets himself wounded. He kills all the guys, but he's wounded in his, in his wolf neck. And so the other one has to, has to get some medicinal leaves to heal them up. And then they have to just hunker down until the 10 days are over when they can finally shed the wolf skins. So they finally do get rid of the wolf skins and they burn them because they, re they realized it was more of a problem. Uh, than they originally wanted. And so again, we have uh, at least a, a kind of wolf pair. Out of all the wolves that I know of in Norse stories, only one of them is Solo, and that's that witch that turned herself into the wolf. Um, but we have a father and son werewolf pair. We have the two wolves eating the sun and moon. We have Gary and Frecky, Odin's wolves. We have Fenrir and Garm. There are some amazing stories. In some ways, this episode was kind of a part two of the werewolves episode. Um, the I, I had a great conversation with Pinkney Benedict several episodes back, and there were many wolves that we never got to. And I, I mentioned them uh, briefly that there were more I wanted to talk about. And so here today was a lot of them, especially my favorite Fenrir. So I hope you enjoyed these stories. Uh, and I hope you got a lot out of it. If you want to uh, send me a question or a comment, please do. Please uh, rate me on iTunes or wherever you listen to it on, uh, Stitcher, or YouTube. Subscribe to me there. You can also check out my website or drop me a message there, joshwoodsauthor.com. Um, which monster are we going to talk about next week? You'll have to stay tuned. I'll talk to you next time on The Monster Professor. Professor.